Proverbs chapter number 22, going to read one verse, verse number 11. He that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend. Now, Brother Rocky, I think you'd either have to be insane or preaching out the wrong Bible to get up here tonight and say that Jesus isn't the best friend you've ever had. Right. It's not under dispute whether or not God is a good friend toward us. Well, what are the requirements to be friends with God? Well, according to this verse, you got two of them. We don't have alliteration tonight. We just got points. Right? To be a friend with the king, first you have to love pureness of heart. What's that called? Righteousness. What's that called? Holiness. Does not the Bible, old and new, both tell us, be ye holy for I am holy? Well, you say, but Brother Jordan, we can't be holy in these body hogwash. God didn't tell you to be holy if you couldn't be holy. Right. He wouldn't give you a commandment that you couldn't keep in order to tempt you to sin. Right. So what's it take to be on good terms with God when it comes to righteousness and holiness? Well, thankfully, those of us have been saved, we've been robed in His righteousness. Sure. Right? We have been imputed with righteousness because God knew that our righteousness wasn't enough. Our righteousness is His filthy rags. Right. Right, but go. we don't have time to go there. We only got seven minutes. Right, if we go over to the book of James, I think it's chapter number 2, verse number 24, Brother Wheeler. It says that Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Yeah. Amen. If you love pureness of heart, you believe God. Right. Talk about more than faith. Yeah. If you believe God, you know what that word believe means? It means that it's settled, that it's true down in your heart. Right. If you believe what the Bible says about who God is and what God is, if you believe Him, it's impossible for you to sin without calling God a liar. Think about the first sin that ever happened over in the Garden of Eden. Why did Eve sin? She was beguiled into believing what? Ye shall not surely die. Sin is born out of calling God a liar. Every time you sin... It's because you don't believe that God's consequences are going to be as bad as God said they would. Every time you sin, it's because you believe that God didn't mean that for you. In truth, sin is to defy God. Anybody remember when Goliath went down, defied the armies of God, all the wicked things that he said to their face? That's what God hears when there's sin in our life. Do you love pureness of heart? Well, sin. Then we heard all about iniquity last night. What that it, literally iniquity is unequal dealing with God. It's robbing God. Right, right. So you're either defying God or you're robbing God when it comes to sin and iniquity. You can't have pureness of heart if you do those two things. But what it doesn't mean that you've got to be perfect to have righteousness imputed unto you. What does it take? Belief. Right. Belief that I am not enough, but he that lives in me is. Right. That I cannot keep myself what I ought to be for God, but that He can make me into and keep me what I ought to be. Right. Abraham wasn't perfect, but you know what Abraham did? He left everything he ever knew because God told him to get to a country that he had never been to. Right. Right. Book of Hebrews tells us that he was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. Why? Because God told him to go. He knew, believed, that God was going to give him a city. Right. All along the way, what we just hear about, he laid his Isaac down. Why? Because he believed, the book of Hebrews tells us, that God was going to raise him up from the dead. Right. Did Abraham have righteousness because he was holy? No, he had righteousness because he believed God enough to do what God said. Amen. Without doubt, without hesitation. Yeah. But see, if you love righteousness, then you get into this thing called the will of God, which we heard about Brother Jeffrey preach this morning. Right. When you live in the will of God, guess what you get? Grace. You receive a whole bunch of grace. Yeah. Best definition I've ever heard is that anagram of the word grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. You can't give grace to somebody else unless God gave it to you. Right. You can't give God's riches if it came from you. Right. So when it says that for the righteousness of this man's lips, the king will be his friend. Where does that grace come from? Well, his heart. Yeah. Out of the mouth, or out of the abundance of the heart, mouth speaks. So as your lips are dripping off grace, where's that grace come from? Because you've got it pressed down, shaking and bubbling over. You can't help but to give it to somebody else. Yeah. But see, those two requirements are what it takes to be friends with the king. 
Jesus promised he'd be a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Jesus promised that he'd never leave you nor forsake you. But see, in order to take advantage of the friendship, you have to choose to be the friend to the king. Someone can want to be a friend to you, but unless you agree to be friends, there's no relationship. There's a lot of people that are willing to sacrifice. There's a lot of people willing to give. There's a lot of people willing to do things just so that they can get on better terms with God. Very few people are doing it because they love Him as a friend. You know what that word friend is defined as, Webster's 1828? One attached to another out of affection. The only attachment between you is the love that you have for the Father. And where do we get that love? I mean, brother, we, we was talking this afternoon. Why do we love God? Because God loved us. Yeah. We love God back with the abundance of the love that He showed toward us. Yeah. Sure. What's the requirement to be friends with Christ? You've got to be willing to love what He is. Yeah. Embrace it. Believe it. Make it a part of you. Yeah. Yeah. Then you've got to be willing to take, like Brother Ron preached about this morning, knock a hole into every part of your life right. and just drip grace everywhere you go. It'll be coming out your mouth. It'll be dripping off your hands. It'll be everywhere that you go. Why? Because that's just what God's filled, it, filled you up with. But see, to be friends with Christ. You know who was called the friend of God? Abraham. You know who else was probably a friend of God? Enoch. Walked with him every day. Those that are God's friends, you know what they do? They spend time with God. We got a whole generation of people today willing to give a whole lot to say that they're, or to feel that they're right with God. Very few people walking around friends with Jesus today. Very few people that are attached solely by affection. Too many people looking for his hand, like Sister Crystal sang about. Too many people just trying to avoid a lightning bolt from heaven. There's no reverence, there's no, there's no admiration, there's no loyalty. You know where that's birthed from? Friendship. We've been adopted. We've been received into the family. But we haven't taken up our friendship. Jesus said he didn't call us servants. He called us friends. And he said that he'd hold nothing back from us. He said he shared everything that the Father gave to him with us. Why? Because we were friends. We weren't servants. We serve him because we love him. And he's God. We, we got to be a servant. We can't be equal with him. But he didn't call us servants. He called us friends. You know why Sheba knew that Solomon was different? Because the servants loved him. His servants were friends to the king. And because they were friends, those servants didn't do out of obligation. They did it out of love. And everywhere they went, they was just dripping grace that they had received from the king. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.